Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming to our discussion tonight. My name is Skylar Oberst. I will be moderating tonight's uh, conversation with our lovely panelists. And before we begin, I just wanted to thank you all for being here and thank the Spokane Library for having this uh, wonderful gathering. And I think it's important to remember that um, for quite some time, libraries have always been the heart of communities. And it's amazing that our library here has opened up its doors after hours in the heat as we all try to find parking downtown. Um, it's really, really wonderful that this is happening. So um, in that spirit, um, because this is a place of learning, because this is a place of community, it's going to be uh, a wonderful discussion tonight. And I thank you all for uh, being here in that spirit. Uh, another thing, too, is that uh, tonight is about mutual respect, about learning. Um, and so tonight, I hope that everybody walks away learning something new and hopefully making a new friend. Um, and with that, uh, in that spirit, I think we're going to go ahead and begin. So um, I'm going to ask the panelists uh, to introduce themselves, share a little bit about uh, their backgrounds and why they're here tonight and what they're hoping to get out of this discussion tonight. So. I'm Nova Cain. I'm the Imperial Sovereign Majesty of the Imperial Sovereign Court of Spokane. Um, I have been performing drag for the last 30 years, um, have been an advocate and an ally to the LGBTQ, LMNOP community for, <laughs> for over 30 years, um, and I was honored when I was asked to be a part of this panel. Um, my background is I have a master's degree in theater production and a master's degree in divinity. What I want out of this evening is just simply the purpose of coming was to be a part of an open discussion as to what drag is as a performance art form, what the background of drag actually was, not the misleading representations that have been presented online. So that's the biggest reason that I'm here is to present what drag is and what drag really is not. So can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, I really, I, I try to start off talking by just taking an opportunity to recognize the space where we're gathered here uh, is built on the traditional homelands of the Spokane people. And uh, the Coeur d'Alene people's traditional homelands are also nearby and many regional tribes share a history in this region. We're assembled right across the street from where interior Salish people historically gathered. Who are you? <laughs> uh, thank you for asking who I am. I'm almost to get to that. I just wanted to say that first. She'll get there. She'll get I'm, there. I'll get there. Uh, so I want to thank Ellen Peters for inviting me to be on the panel, Skylar for moderating, <laughs> and all of my fellow panelists for taking the time to get together and have this great conversation. Thank you. Um, and all of you for coming as our neighbors to talk about how important this issue is in our community. Uh, so I have a letter of thanks that I'll give in a moment, but after I introduce myself, uh, my name is Lisa Logan. I'm the manager of the Women's and Gender Education Center at Eastern Washington University, and I use they, them, their pronouns. <laughs> I have a BA in Women's and Gender Studies from Eastern and a Master's Degree in Gender and Women's Studies from the University of Arizona. And I just want to take a moment to make sure that as we're all gathered, that we are talking about this very important issue that we also remember our transgender siblings and the importance of, of being there, showing up in this way for them as well. Um, there's, yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's an event tomorrow that's a benefit for Solace. Tickets are free. It's at the um, 
it's at the Magic Lantern Theater, and I'll, I'll just save this for later, but I, I have flyers. I just want to make sure folks can get them if they want. App, Solace is an incredible app. I see the maker of the app in the back of the room. Woo, Robbie! <laughs> so I just want to be sure that while we're all here, we're hearing about lots of different stories, so thank you for that as well. Um, I think that's all, other than the letter of thanks. Uh, so we, uh, myself and a group of about five other folks collected 680 signatures on a letter of thanks for the Spokane Public Library, and I'd like to give these to Ellen. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> So uh, I'm just here now to get to your answer. Sorry, I, <laughs> I won't good. be this long-winded the whole time. I just had a lot of kind of things I needed to take care of. So um, I'm here to make sure that uh, we take into account a lot of different perspectives. I want to hear from my own neighbors, my community members, and be sure that we're here uh, coming to understand, to truly understand drag together and talk about why Drag Queen Story Hour is such an amazing thing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My name is uh, John Estelle. I'm a psychologist here in. Uh, I'm a psychologist here in town. Uh, my wife and I have a practice called Cornerstone, um, and I'm here because I want to be uh, affirming as a therapist, as a psychologist. I was also. I also finished an MDiv, Nova, mm -hmm. and so have some, um, uh, uh, many of our clients come to us because we have some training theologically as well, uh, but we have lots of non-religious clients who come to see us. And so I'm here, my purpose for being here, Skylar, is I want to be an affirming and supportive therapist uh, to the community as well, and um, I think that's about it. Hello, hello. Uh, a lot of people out here already know who I am. Uh, my name is Tierney Hex, normally. Uh, right now I'm kind of not in a full face, but I figured I should put on my business you know, attire so we could get into business. Um, I am the queen that is responsible for this whole kerfuffle. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't have uh, super flashy credentials to you know, show off. Um, I'm glad that we have a panel full of people who are educated in, in different aspects of this. Uh, I came to the library a year ago as a citizen, um, as a drag queen, as a performer, and as a lover of literacy and a lover of knowledge. And I uh, you know, pitched this idea to them, and a year later, here we are. Um, <laughs> I didn't think it was going to turn into this, but I'm really, really excited to see so many uh, faces out in the audience tonight and to see so many people in support of this. Um, as far as what I want to achieve with tonight, uh, I would really love to dispel a lot of the rumors that exist uh, regarding whether or not it's appropriate for queer people to exist in front of children. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I went to the library with this uh, program because I have been a teacher of children for many, many years. My mother was a paraeducator for, uh, you know, children that were in different tracks in, in school. Um, I would go during my summers and read to them, teach them, you know, reading, teach them English, um, all those things that I'm relatively decent at. Uh, <laughs> And um, it's something that's always been a major passion of mine, and drag has also always been a major passion of mine, and to be able to take those things and combine them together and do something for my community at the same time was just sort of a dream come true. Um, and I really hope that throughout tonight we get a chance to kind of um, get into the nitty gritty of all of it and really sort of get some uh, educated opinions on these claims that have been issued, so. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. Thanks for that. Um, I'm Pastor Andy Castro-Lang, 
and I serve as pastor at Westminster Congregational United Church of Christ. Somebody back there just stuck their fist in the air, and most people are like, huh? So, well, hi, UCC person. Um, um, so, yeah, I also have an MDiv. Good Lord, we're heavy with those tonight. <laughs> but I think part of the reason I'm here is because I was raised in a household by two cultural anthropologists, and what really mattered to them was not to be a bigot, and not to be ignorant. And so um, they taught me to seek out lifelong learning. I expect to learn lots. I want to learn lots. I want to learn how to be a better neighbor and friend. I want to learn how to always be a better pastor. And um, in my denomination, the United Church of Christ, some of our churches vote to be called open and affirming. And that means that we are open and affirming of all members of the community who come to us. All are welcome. <laughs> and I guess I'm here tonight to let you know that even though there's only one of me up here, there are other Christian churches that are friends and allies. Um, and. <laughs> And it really sucks to have to represent Christianity sometimes um, because we do a lot of disservice. Um, so I'm here to try and be a friendly face and a learning seeking soul with all of you tonight. Thank you. I think it's working now. I think we're good. Woo! All right. So panel, I think let's just start off. Uh, tonight we're having a conversation about drag. Um, what is drag? Let's start there. Who wants to take this one? <laughs> drag is a performance art. Drag is a, an opportunity for performers, for individuals, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of gender, regardless of who the individuals are, uh, to present a character in a nature of fun, um, in sometimes humorous manners, sometimes um, an in-your-face challenge. Um, Drag actually was created, uh, despite rumors of it starting in the 1800s with uh, minstrel shows, drag goes as far back as ancient Greece and existed well into the 19th century. And the reason it existed was because it was illegal and immoral for women to pre be presented publicly on a stage or to see them perform in that manner. Um, so William Shakespeare uh, is actually the one credited with the term drag because he had written in the margin of one of his plays the abbreviations D-R-A-G, which means dressed as girl. So the claims of misogyny as you read William Shakespeare, especially Taming of the Shrew, I don't see where Catherine was at all suppressed or, well, they definitely tried to suppress her. <laughs> drag for me as a performance artist is a celebration of not just who I am, but of femininity, of the female form, of who women are. So the claim that drag is misogynistic to me is quite frankly ludicrous. Um, drag is a performance art. This is an opportunity for me to express an art form and express my creativity in front of a group of people. Nine times out of 10, that is in a, uh, a forum of individuals that are 21 and over because it's done in nightclubs. Um, but drag is not limited to nightclubs. We have the ability, obviously, to dress in a manner which would be deemed conservative by some. <laughs> so the fact that a drag queen is reading to a child is not putting that child at any more threat or risk than having your grandmother read to a child. So 
I, I've been performing in drag for about a year and a half, a uh, little bit over, give or take. Um, I have been lucky enough to host a show regularly at The Pin, which is an all-ages venue. The owner's here tonight. Hello. Um, <laughs> I've been hosting that show for over a year now, and uh, our show is an amateur night, which means anyone that is interested in signing up uh, is welcome to do so. Our doors are completely open to whoever, um, and a large portion of our performers in those shows are what we call AFAB in the community, which means assigned female at birth, myself included. Um, so there is this misconception that drag is only men dressing as women, and I'm here to tell you, that is not true. Um, <laughs> not only are there women doing drag as men, there are women doing drag as women, there are men doing drag as men. It, th literally the possibilities are endless because drag on top of being a performance art is the performance of gender. We are taking the concept of gender and we get to adapt it however we want. We get to present it in whatever way that we want to. Doesn't matter what gender you want to present, you can present a, a monster if you want to. That's a thing that, that happens pretty frequently in drag. Um, drag, just like any other performance art, any kind of art, painting, sculpting, acting, dancing, singing, there are parts of it that are completely acceptable to put in front of children, and there are parts that are not acceptable to put in front of children. There are paintings that you should not show your five-year-old. <laughs> there are drag performances that you should not show your five-year-old. But then we have queens like uh, this, uh, one of the alumni from the most recent season of RuPaul's Drag Race, her name is Nina West, and she's actually released an entire album with I think like 10 or 11 tracks on it, and it's a children's album. They are songs for kids. It sounds just like anything you'd hear from the Wiggles, from, you know, that's, that's my extent of kids' bands. <laughs> that's all I know. <laughs> But um, yeah, it, it's, it's a performance art, it's open to anyone. We are taking the concept of gender and we are examining it every single time that we get on stage and we perform. I've been in theater for over 20 years. I've been acting in local theaters um, for a very long time. And uh, there was always a part of me that felt a little bit unfulfilled by that because when you do theater, you are an actor or you are a director or you are a producer. Doing drag allows me to do all of that. I get to be the costumer, I get to be the concept designer, I get to be the wig stylist, my mom does. <laughs> but I get to create all of it. It's all me, it's all whatever world I wanna create for my audience and we get to give moments to people. And that is the most beautiful thing I think that anyone can do for another person is to give them moments that they can look back on in their lives and say, gosh, that was really freaking cool. That was really beautiful, that was really moving, that was really, you know, it, we, we connect by, you know, creating connections with other people. We grow as a society by creating those connections. And uh, we, I personally am uh, done with letting drag be consigned to adult-only spaces. Um, we as queer people have every right to exist outside of adult spaces and we have been pigeonholed into those spaces and now we're being told we're not allowed to leave them. And I'm here to say that that stops now. <laughs> and I have to say, I have a four-year-old granddaughter who is your soulmate. <laughs> Give her any day of the week, any freedom to dress, to make up, to play, to be flexible, to blow apart. Let's face it, when you're two, three, four, and five, you don't really, well, you hopefully still have a wide open mind and anything's possible. She'll use whatever damn pronoun she pleases day to day. And, and I'm thinking, um, just this past Sunday, we had a conversation among some of our members uh, about their struggles to, to find a place to be at home, find their way into loving community, find their way, and the struggle, 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 because these were all older folks, and the young people in the audience went, wow, I guess we're the beneficiaries of this. I'm thinking my granddaughter is the beneficiary of this conversation. I 
don't have a lot to add. Y'all covered it fabulously. <laughs> but I just want to add one little thing. Drag seems to me like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> And it would be a really fun and really difficult job. And I just also, I think that there is a lot of potential for really critiquing gender normativity that our children, like you mentioned, Andy, still have these really wonderfully open minds. Um, and I think that it has the potential really to blow gender wide open, which is part of why it's so scary, but mostly just a huge amount of work that I really appreciate and benefit from. <laughs> So I want to ask a question to the panel. Um, we're talking about creating spaces, um, performance, and I think about my life and how important it was to, as a child, have that creative space to make my own world and to move through it. Um, what would be benefits for children to have that free license and that freedom? Anybody want to take that on? I grew up in a very small town in rural Wyoming. I learned at a very young age to escape my reality, to create my own reality uh, through, uh, through the public library. My grandmother was a second grade school teacher. And going to the library, my mother worked in a bank. As soon as I got done with school, I would go to the library until my mother got off. The library literally was a block away from the bank. The library was my safe space. The library was the place that I could find myself and broaden myself. Um, I find it offensive that anyone would tell any person out there, you are not allowed at a public library. Andrew Carnegie donated $60 million in the 20s and 30s to build public libraries across the United States to battle illiteracy. You teach a child to read a book and you open that child's mind to every single possibility that is afforded that individual. If you teach that child hate and ignorance, that child's mind is closed at a very, very early age. And I feel sorry for those children that are not exposed to the wonders of literature. There's a Facebook meme, and I'm sure it's a quote. I don't know who ever said it originally. Um, in a truly great library, there is something that will offend everyone. I think that in addition to this really, really vital focus on increasing literacy, that is uh, really a core value of Drag Queen Story Hour since the beginning, um, it teaches children empathy. It can teach children to kind of harness their creativity, uh, to celebrate difference instead of hiding it, right? Or instead of uh, feeling shame about all kinds of differences. Um, it helps curb bullying. And it provides our youth with much needed LGBTQ plus role models at a time where uh, youth suicide attempts among LGBTQ plus youth is on the rise and uh, far more common than among our straight and gender normative counterparts. Um, you know, the literacy is the core of it, and there is so much more that it teaches our kids that I think is just so important. And kids have so much in common with drag queens. I just love <laughs> seeing, I mean, in preparation, I watched a lot of videos of drag queen story hours, and it's just like, kids can see themselves, all kids can see themselves reflected, and it's exciting, and people are just being their true selves, which is really rare. Nowadays, I mean, people don't want to be, people feel shy or ashamed or scared or vulnerable and don't really want to be out there and, and loud and uh, flamboyant. But when children can see folks truly being themselves and expressing themselves in creative ways, I think it gives them something that there's almost nothing else that will accomplish the same thing. Mm 
Awesome. I think for children um, who are at a critical age of um, trying to define um, their own gender identity and their gender expression, uh, their, how they're going to live in this world, having a multiplicity of um, examples in the adult world of people who um, are allowing um, expansive kinds of understandings of gender is very important, um, especially um, at y young ages, um, even before going into um, the school system when identity uh, is a crucial issue. And later on in adolescence, when sexual identity becomes a big part of that gender expression as well. Um, and, and so I, um, I'm thankful that there are people who are willing to um, show children a multiplicity of um, examples of how to live out gender. <laughs> One of the things that was most important to me in forming this Drag Queen Story Hour was that we don't have three men dressed as women. Um, I think it's very, very important that we show the diversity of drag and we show that it's you know, available to everyone, um, which is why you know, I'm a female that does drag as a female. Uh, we have a male drag queen that does drag as a female, and then we have a female that does drag as a man. Um, all, all of that is going to be represented. Um, we have all sexualities, you know, all of us have different uh, views on our sexualities and things like that. I feel it's important to note, we obviously are not going to be teaching these kids about what it means to be gay and what it means to be all these things. That's not our goal here. Um, our goal with this story hour is to teach these kids that regardless of what someone else looks like, how they act, what they, you know, what they say, who they love, um, you have no place in telling them that they are not allowed to do that. And um, I think it's very apt that we're having this kind of uh, discourse over this event because this is exactly the kind of thing that we are trying to fight against. And um, from a personal level, I grew up in a very, very small town in rural Kansas. Um, it was terrible, just so you all know. Um, <laughs> And I spent the first 20 years of my entire life trying to make myself fit into something that was not working. And I tried everything that I could. I tried religion. I tried to, you know, make friends with the right people. I tried to do the right things and say the right things. And none of it fit. And I spent 20 years of my life hating myself and not knowing why those feelings were there. And as soon as I was able to move somewhere that was a little bit more understanding and a little bit more open, I came to understand that you cannot fit a square peg into a round hole. And we are who we are. There is no turning people gay. That's not a thing that exists. If your kids become gay, they were already gay. Um, and I think that's very, very important that we show these kids that regardless of who is telling you that these are the things that you have to be, they don't, get to, they don't get to control that. You are your own person. It is your body. It is your mind. It is your heart. It is your spirit. And no one else can tell you what that means or what that should look like. And that's my entire goal with this whole thing. One of the things I heard last week when talking to Ellen from the library is that they were being swamped by hateful speech and threats. Phone numbers had been discovered, emails had been discovered, and they were being flooded with meanness. And she said to me, are there any friendly Christians out there? <laughs> it's so bad to have this happen and happen around our great hope, our great joy, which is our children, to turn them into a uh, battleground or a tool um, for hate. And 
there's a saying with the good folks at Planned Parenthood, we won't go back. I'm old enough to remember being bullied for being different. I bet you are too, no matter what age you are. And we want to move into a better world. We want these beautiful children to learn the beauty of all people and the diversity of ways of living in this world. We don't want to go back. We want something better. And it's up to us to sit here and go there and be who we are and be glad and celebrate it and be proud together. All right, I think we, we're good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, let's, let's, let's dive a little deeper. Let's talk about conformity. Let's talk about confusion. Let's talk about misinformation. Let's talk about um, being left out and being passed over and what that's like. I think that there's a lot of people in this room, in the audience, maybe even on this panel, I know, at least sitting in this chair, who have felt that before. Um, and I think that on, within this conversation, there are multiple sides uh, who feel this very thing. Um, I'm wondering if the panel has any advice on how to move forward together and how to, uh, let's, let's dive in, let's talk about confusion. Because there are people who are scared. I, I find the narrative that if kids are confronted or, or faced with drag queens that they will be confused, I find that to be confusing myself. Um, we are all confused when we see new things. When we see something we've never seen before, it confuses us. And sometimes fear comes in conjunction with that. The best way to confront those fears and to overcome that confusion is to dive in. You know, um, I, I find that a lot of these people that say that, you know, kids are going to be confused if, if they see a drag queen. I ask them, you know, have you have you met a drag queen? Have you ever sat down and like had dinner with someone that does drag? And the answer is almost resoundingly always no. And of course, you're going to be confused by something that you have no idea what it is. Um, if you're taking what the media says, you know, as as you know, this is biblical law, this is what it is, there's nothing else that it could possibly be, then like, why are we the people that are in the wrong? Like, who listens to the media to get all of your information about anything, you know? Um, and, and that's something that really is, is uh, again, one of the things that we really want to overcome with this Drag Queen Story Hour. If there are kids out there that, that are confused by the idea of what a drag queen is, it's super easy to teach them what they are. They're adults that play dress up. That's it. <laughs> That's all it is. And I think right. <laughs> I think this idea of confusion is a, a misnomer because uh, I personally feel that the real argument behind this, as I've said already, is that queer people are not allowed to exist in public spaces. It is my First Amendment right to go into a library and to read to children if that's what I want to do. And there is no one that can stop me from doing that because our Constitution guarantees that I'm allowed to. And if your kids are confused, bring them up to me. I will gladly talk to them. I'll gladly have a conversation with them. I have many friends that have kids and I love hanging out with kids and having fun with them. And that's a big part of why I'm doing this whole thing. And um, I, I just really think that people would rather give in to that fear and that confusion than confront that head on. And that doesn't make you strong or it doesn't make you empowered, it makes you a coward. So I also think it's hard for us to accept the position of humble student, of learner. And the more we can accept the fact that you're going to teach me, you know, that I'm confused or my kids are confused. And so you ask the damn question, let go of your pride, let go of your certitudes, be a student, 
humble yourself and learn from others. Okay, I was about to say, what's so hard about that? <laughs> All of it. <laughs> right? Just do it anyway. And, and watch the kids. Kids don't have this problem of, are you a girl or a boy? And, 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 then, and then they're like, really? Can I be one too? <laughs> I work in a clinical setting, so people usually come there when they're feeling uh, pain uh, and um, confusion and, or being left out in the LGBTQ plus community um, causes great pain, great pain. Um, I was at a training recently with uh, um, Lord Dickey. Uh, a trans man, um, and he was quoting the statistic that I, you were alluding to earlier that suicide attempts in <coughs> LGBTQ plus teens is more than 50%. That attempts, that's one in two. One, two, three, four, five, six. That would be three of us up here. Um, and cisgendered individuals across their life span, the percentage is 0.6%, 0.6%. So being left out or confused uh, um, or alienated or bullied is reality. And um, we need to be um, finding ways of supporting that community instead of alienating it. So I think that this is how we can start to move forward as a community. Um, yeah, I don't really have, I mean, what you all said is so amazing, but I think that if the folks in this room <laughs> continue to show their support in the way that I've seen over the last three weeks, that we, we, we are, we are moving forward as a community and being willing to have these difficult conversations with each other is really the beginning of um, so much more. So that's all I have to add other than, did it, who hasn't got it? <laughs> as someone who has uh, attempted suicide on more than one occasion, um, it is terrifying. The fact that somebody would even imply that being a homosexual or transgendered is a choice, I would have never chosen this for myself. I would have never chosen to be ostracized, to have my father threaten my life, to have lost that relationship with that man for over a decade. And it wasn't until that man had a heart attack and faced his own mortality that he was able to look and accept his son for everything that I am. I grew up in Reagan era, uh, a Republican, died in the wool, Wyoming. Um, I did all of the things that I was supposed to do. I was the captain of the rodeo team. I went to college on a livestock evaluation scholarship. And the first time that I will ever admit this in public, 1987 High Sheep Evaluator. <laughs> Somebody asked me one time, it was like, what does exactly does that mean? I could tell you which one's pretty. <laughs> but no, growing up in, in uh, Wyoming in that era, um, especially at the midpoint of the AIDS epidemic. Um, at that point, uh, sex education in Wyoming was stunted, to say the least. Um, they were not talking about HIV, they were not talking about AIDS, they were talking about a disease called GRID, gay-related immune disease. Um, and after having taken uh, a public sex education, 
um, and being terrified that I was going to give myself the gay cancer, I masturbated in a condom until I was 16 years old. That is a true story. Um, and that's really where, where we have come as a country, where we have come as uh, a public education, is now we know more. But the fact that at the time of the AIDS epidemic, people were so terrified that they wouldn't even talk about it. The President of the United States would not even acknowledge the fact that it was happening. We won't go back. We have come this far, and by God, we have fought hard to get here. Now, I'm not saying that every devout Christian should subject their poor innocent lambs to the idea of tyranny hex, reading Mary's Got a Little Glam. <laughs> but for the... <laughs> You bad girl. Uh, <laughs> what I'm saying is, this is the United States. We have the right to choose. We have the right to say we support or do not support. But you know what? You don't have the right to tell me that I could not bring my children and my grandchildren to this institution of learning. And if I choose to let my grandchildren and children watch Andrea, read Mary's Got a Little Glam. That is my right. How dare you try to threaten that? So what is it about gender that makes people go bonkers? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was thinking about what about this particular event is causing all this hatred? And gender is something, it's sort of a line in the sand for a lot of people, I think. Um, it makes, drag makes the permeability of gender very apparent. And that causes a lot of discomfort for a lot of us. Um, a lot of us like to think that gender is immutable, unchangeable, solid, and it's just not. It's just not. Uh, it's, it's culturally enforced, right? Along with many of our institutions, our language and our imaginations limit us on what we can think of the possibilities of gender as. Um, and it's just, it can be really one of the most uncomfortable aspects of diversity for a lot of us because pretty much every institution upholds gender as women, men, no blurred lines in between. Uh, we learn, like, when you're pregnant, if you've ever been pregnant in this room, the number one per question that people ask is, what? what is it? Yeah, what are you having? Um, and people decide before you've ever given birth how that child will be treated for the rest of its life. So this is like, this is serious business for a lot of people. And I'm sure, Andy, that you can talk if you have anything <laughs> about, I'm not a, a scriptural expert, but I, you know, I talk about all of our institutions are upholding this dichotomous idea of gender. And it's just really hard. It's hard for, even as a person who identifies as um, genderqueer, gender fluid, non-binary, it's hard for me to wrap my own brain around my own gender, let alone the genders of my kids um, and all of us. So, you know, it's hard. That's all I can say. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was so hoping you'd take this one. <laughs> okay, so. Nova especially was talking about the beauty of the library as a place of learning. And 
I tend to look at scripture, both the Jewish texts and the Christian ones, sort of as a library. And like any good library, there's going to be something in there that everybody hates. You just got to pick. Yeah, or like me, you could find a lot that you dislike. That's not a book you're going to read. That's not the kind of literature you approve of or appreciate. Um, that's the difficulty of the library known as the Bible. But I am learning that a lot of that, I continue to learn that a lot of what we know in English-speaking Bibles, sitting in our homes or gathering dust somewhere, um, that you we all have to be very careful with language because we know that we're limited by English and that they are written in other languages and other cultural contexts and ancient worldviews that you and I just sometimes can't wrap our heads around. And so the, uh, that book should be an object of study. Um, I don't believe for a moment that scripture is meant to be an answer book. It is many things. It's literature, it's poetry, it's naughty, it's, you know, it's subversive. And I just don't get, well, I understand that people want it to be simple, but I think they're not doing justice to the beauty of it and the complexity of it to strip it down to yes and no, black and white. It's impossible. And it does, this book that so many people value, it does it a huge disservice. So if you've got it and it's collecting dust somewhere, open it carefully. <laughs> Try not to be too afraid. But be careful, because it's strange and it's ancient and it's different. <coughs> and as I just discovered recently, maybe you know this, in Hebrew, there aren't two, male and female. There are five. Five. How come I never learned this in school? Five genders? Five ways of speaking? I'm telling you, we got to dig this stuff up and reclaim it. I think one of the reasons that it is so frightening is because uh, growing up the way I did, men don't cry. You're a man. Men don't cry. Guess what? I cry. And I have that right and that ability, and it does not make me less of a human. In fact, I think it makes me more of a human than a man who will stand there. I was six years old. Um, I was... Uh, we were. I was an army brat. Uh, my father was was stationed in Germany, and I lived there until I was seven. Um, up until we came back to the United States, European are, Europeans are amazing, tactile, loving, compassionate, passionate people. They do everything with passion. They eat with passion. They love with passion. Two men walking down the street holding hands is not a sign of sexuality. That is a sign of affection. This means that this is my friend, and I am walking down the street, and the two of us are talking. This is my friend. Men kissing on the mouth had nothing to do with sexuality. That was affection. I am showing you, my friend, that I love you. I lived there until I was seven years old, when we came back to the United States. Actually, it happened when I was six. We came back for, for a visit. Um, my father had invited some high school friends over for uh, cocktails and dinner and um, it came bedtime. I loved bedtime. Bedtime was that time where you go take a bath, you get on your pajamas, you go down, mommy and daddy give you a big hug and a kiss and you go to bed and usually you get a story read to you. I went to crawl up on my father's lap and give him that hug and kiss and he stood up and shoved me to the ground. Men don't kiss, we shake hands. At six years old, I could not figure out what I had done to upset my loving and tender and tactile father. But then I saw the terror in his eyes of his friends. He was terrified to think what his friends would think of him if his son kissed him on the mouth. We need to take away those boundaries. We need to take away these stereotypes 
That's what's causing confusion, is when you tell your son, man up, no, tell your son to be human. This is a really hard job for me because this is such a fabulous panel. Can I get everybody to join me in another round of applause, please? I mostly did that to buy a couple more seconds to figure out the next question. <laughs> because we're burning through all of my notes, which is amazing. Um, I've never been to a drag queen story hour. Has anybody, has it been done here in Spokane? No, has it been done in Washington State? Or uh, how did this start? What's the origins of this program? So Drag Queen Story Hour is an organization that was started, I believe, in San Francisco, I want to say. Um, and it was some queens that uh, saw the need for um, you know, bringing the ideas of inclusiveness and acceptance and openness and communication to children, as well as promoting literacy. And um, they started that program, and it has caught on like wildfire. Uh, because there's nothing that kids love more than a big, sparkly, shiny character <laughs> and reading a really fun story. Um, <laughs> so, uh, like I said, personally, I, I brought this to the library because I think that here in town, um, we're very lucky in that for the size of a town that we have, we have at least four different venues which regularly feature queer performers, queer artists, and things of, of that nature um, as it pertains to drag. Um, but those spaces are almost all 21 and over. And um, I'm kind of straddling the line between the older generation and the kids as far as my age. And I see all the time kids that are 14, 15, 16 that you know, want to express this part of themselves, whether it's their femininity, whether it's a character that they've created. Um, they want to express that, but there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere for them to do it. Um, and uh, in the drag community, we call them bedroom queens <laughs> because that's the only place that they're able to express themselves. And I think that's a huge disservice to the youth of our community. And I really think that if we're not watching out for our kids and making sure that they're able to express themselves and be freely open, then we're, we're gonna lose this battle in the long run. And we've come way too far, as Nova said earlier, for us to even, you know, have the risk of, of sliding backwards. And um, I really think that Drag Queen Story Hour is a really fun thing. I think that uh, my goal with this entire thing is for these kids to walk away from this afternoon with a shining memory. And um, I think we've all had those moments in our childhood where our parents have taken us to something um, and it just stays with you. It, it becomes a part of who you are. It becomes a memory that is a cherished thing for you. And as I've said many times, and I'll continue to say, if we can do that for a single child uh, in this two-week span, then I feel like we've done our job. Like I said before, the public library for me was my escape. That was the, the place that I felt freedom, felt creativity, and my mind was blown on more than one occasion. Um, because it was such an amazing space for me when I was in high school and even into college, I participated in just story hour. Um, I would go in and volunteer my time, as did my grandmother and several other members of my family, to go in and do the reading of different stories for different age groups and, and opening their minds. And when Andrea initially brought this up, it was like, oh my God, we're headed into pride. I don't know if I've got time for this, but I think it's an amazing idea. Um, I, I totally support the idea. And I think a three to eight year old is not going to leave drag story time going, oh mommy, that lady was so weird. <laughs> or, oh mommy, I really loved what he was wearing. They're going to go, Tyranny X is amazing. Because at that age, they don't identify the gender. 
the fact that I am a drag queen reading a story about whether it be Rapunzel or a Thumbelina or a classic tale or even some of the new uh, My Princess Boy. Um, there are so many of these books. These children are going to be fed by the imagery of what they see, the person who is reading that, and the pictures that that person can paint within their mind. And that's why I think Drag Queen Story Hour is, is important. And again, if you don't want to bring your children, guess what? You don't have to. So we've talked a lot about gender identity, identity itself, and something that uh, preparing for this panel that I found was concerns from some community members talking about the difference between drag and blackface. <laughs> and I wanted to get your thoughts on that panel. Let's see, uh, what was it that was said in the uh the spokesman um, comparing a hangnail to the Holocaust. Uh, drag is not blackface. It is nothing like blackface. Blackface specifically was used as a comedic, horribly, horrible comedic avenue to make fun of African Americans. Okay, we as Americans historically have a really messed up history of what we think is funny. I hearken to a time where Pollock jokes were popular. Uh, Mick and Patty jokes, making fun of the Irish, making fun of Poles. We made fun of the Italians. We made fun of fat people. We made fun of thin people. We have made fun of all of these people through the course of time. Drag is an entertainment and performance art. We are not making fun of anyone other than possibly ourselves. Because a lot of you who have been to my shows know I usually start off with, this is gonna be funny, it's gonna be raunchy, it's gonna be racy, but I'm a 50 year old fat bald guy in a dress. It doesn't get any funnier than that. <laughs> so I think uh, I'm no expert in the history of blackface. By no means uh, do I want to represent myself as such. In fact, we uh, had invited some of our faculty from Africana Studies to join us on the panel, but they are having their graduation tonight. Yeah, and couldn't be here. So I asked them for a few things that I could say. Some of this is from them, some of it's from my thinking, but. Um, the, the thing that I thought of right away when I saw that post on the group's page um, is that blackface is a concept that was created by a dominant group, okay? And drag is something that is, wasn't necessarily created by an oppressed group, but it was created by artists and um, actors, right? In the early days of Greece, Rome, Japan, India, um, all of Europe. All of Europe. Yeah, right. That was uh, kind of reclaimed, so to speak, by primarily gay men at first, and it's grown to be all the folks who you mentioned. But the important thing is that uh, blackface, this one's from Africana Studies, is imposing a symbol that personifies an entire group's inferiority. And it was, it's been used and still is used to legitimize treating people as less than human, as mindless buffoons, animals, rapists, and having an innate criminal potential. So completely different then this uh, d drag isn't used in any way to form and solidify an idea among the dominant group about women. Um, this is an example for me of an oppressed group expressing themselves. So apples and oranges, or what you said. <laughs> <laughs> My response to, uh, my, my first instinct to is drag, uh, you know, comparable to blackface is, um, no! 
<laughs> Once we start to get into it, um, <laughs> The thing is, I'm, as I said, I'm biologically born a female. I consider myself non-binary, uh, but I am biologically and by all, you know, operative purposes, by those that don't bother to learn anything, uh, I am a woman who dresses up as a woman. So please someone explain to me <laughs> how in the world that is uh, me being misogynistic towards women. I am... I do drag because it is a way for me as a non-binary person to take the expectations that society places on me because I have a feminine form and I can put it in their face and I can tell them, do you see how ridiculous this looks? Do you see how I, like not womanly this person looks? Like she's crazy, you know what I mean? And I, I'm, I'm just flabbergasted by this, by this comparison because First of all, it is not our place to have this conversation. It is not our place as people that are passing for white to say what is and is not comparable to an art form that is disgusting and you know derogatory and discriminatory. It is not our place to talk about it. That is not our conversation to have. It is our job, it is our job as people who are white passing to create spaces for these conversations to be had, not to have them ourselves. And I am sick to death of being told that I am appropriating my own gender because the performance art that I choose to do doesn't make sense to you. So, is drag blackface? No, sure is. I'm wondering if I could lean on the panel's expertise with all these div, uh, divinity degrees and um, expertise in sheep. Um, <laughs> we got to work that in somehow, right? <laughs> um, so I was raised in a Christian household. And uh, whatever that means, it's exactly what it was like. And. <laughs> I, um, one of the things that sticks out to me when I dust off my Bible is um, loving my neighbor. And it's really hard for someone who professes to, when they are, when they say that they're a Christian, um, to love your neighbor, whether they are in drag, whether they are gay, whether they are straight, whether they are ultra conservative. And I'm wondering if the panel has any advice on how to do that for our entire community, because it seems like, to me, we live in a fabulous city. And I use that word very, very deliberately here. Um, but one of the things that will help us move forward together, all together, is love of neighbor. And I'm wondering if we can glean anything out of the good book and out of everybody's expertise um, with the flocks, so to speak. <laughs> From the good book, uh, one of my favorite chapters, 1 Corinthians 13. So now the, the conclusion when uh, Paul is talking about the, the greatest gift of all, love, the greatest spiritual gift, the conclusion is, so there's three things that remain, faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. And... Um, I think our spiritual callings uh, as a community, whatever your background is, is to learn uh, a loving disposition, a loving respect uh, for your neighbors, all of them. There was a pastor in the Midwest, his name was Andrew Marin, um, who uh, moved his family into uh, the Boys Town area of Chicago um, where there's a high population of LGBTQ plus peoples. He did that because three of his friends came out to him and said, your preaching is offensive and you're pushing us away. And uh, he started a foundation that was built on trying to build bridges between uh, the evangelical community and the LGBTQ plus community. His book, Love is an Orientation, he tried, he tried to live that out with his family in the Chicago area just to be a loving presence. 
that love is the greatest spiritual gift. And unfortunately, uh, shame and um, uh, isolation of others seems to uh, be something that many people from the Christian community um, use to alienate others in the name of telling truth or finding truth. And I w hope that we as a community would learn how to love each other. Skylar. <laughs> You have all night. <laughs> so I'm an old hippie, and <laughs> and among the old Christian hippies, way back in the day, there was a song that you'll know they are Christians by their love. Oh my gosh! And it was such a corny song, and we all love to sing it. And damn it, it still makes utter sense. You will know Christians by what they do. I don't care how much Bible you've memorized. If you can't be loving, if you can't build up this city, if you can't open your heart and your mind, then I don't know what your language you're speaking, but it's not the language of love. Christ hung out with people that would have been deemed um, inappropriate. <laughs> Tax collectors, prostitutes, lepers, these were people that he took time to spend time with, to show his love and affection to. Not saying that those individuals who live a Christ-like life don't need that. He lived by example. He told stories by example. The Bible is a great handbook. It's a guidebook. It is something that, yeah, it gives you inspiration. Um, the Big Ten are the Big Ten. I don't care what religion you are. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. I mean, these are, I'm sorry, sodomy didn't even make the top ten. Um, <laughs> So, loving thy neighbor, whether they're gay, straight, bisexual, Lebanese, Japanese, uh, from Mars, love thy neighbor. Again, a Facebook meme. Did I stutter? <laughs> there are a lot of things in the Bible that they talk about. Um, the uh, uh, mosaic law, uh, cloth made of mixed fibers. Um, am I obligated to take my mother out into the front yard myself and stone her, or do I invite people over and do a barbecue while we do this? Um, touching the skin of an unclean pig. Um, I mean, there are so many of those other laws in the Bible. If you want to start quoting me, if a man lay with another man, they shall be stoned, well, we just legalized marijuana, so now we get that one. Sorry, that was a cheap shot. I had to take that. <laughs> um, panel, is there anything else that we should know about drag, this, uh, this, this event that's coming up? If I am new to town and I'm looking, what do I need to know um, before I, I head up to the hill? Well, the hill, the south hill. South. <laughs> the hill, a hill. It's happening, hill. oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so... There are a few points that I would like to make regarding uh, Saturday. Um, I'm sure many of you in this audience have heard a lot of the discourse that's been going on. Um, I know it can be scary. I know that there are a lot of people saying a lot of things that they plan on doing and plan on you know, saying and, and so on and so forth. I want you all to know that we have been working very closely and very diligently with the library to ensure that this event will remain safe for the kids, for the parents, for the protesters, for the counter protesters, it will remain a safe event. And I would love for those that are planning on attending the counter protest to please understand that we are 
vehemently nonviolent. We will not accept people into our counter protest that are yelling across the lines, that are threatening violence, that are paying attention at all to the protests happening. We are there as a counter protest to turn this into a celebration. It is, our, it is our entire intention that all of the kids that are outside on the lawn with us in this counter protest are having a great, fun day. We want them to walk away from this with a shiny memory as well as, oh my gosh, I remember that time I went to the library and there were like hundreds of people there and there were bubbles and coloring books and we sang songs by the Wiggles. Again, that's all I know, sorry. <laughs> But that, that is our intention. And if that is not your intention for this counter protest, please stay home. It has to, it has to remain nonviolent. This is an event for children. And there is nothing else that makes me angrier <laughs> than the fact that people are trying to bring violence into an event that is focused on children. I would also like to stress that as scary as some of these things have been that have been said, we cannot let fear stop us from standing up for what is right. We have to... Those of us in the, in the LGBTQ plus community, we already know this fight. This is something we face every single day that we exist openly and proudly. This is not new to us. Those of you in this audience that are cis, het, whatever, those of you that fall into that main category or fall into that ally category, we need you now more than ever. It is, it is now. We had, this past weekend, those many people know, we had pride, and we had a record-breaking 27,000 plus people show up to the park. And I know not every single person in that park, you know, uh, considered themselves part of the LGBT community. There were many, many, many allies there that I got to meet, shake hands with, hug their kids. Um, and it is now that you guys have to stand up and fight with us. We have made this platform. We need your support. If you are too afraid to come, we understand that. We know that it is a scary thing to do. But if you have the ability to, to push that fear down and to come and be a part of this celebration and of this uplifting of our community, then you need to be there. Being in the corner of 4th and Washington for quite a while now, like 140 years, that's how long Westminster's been here in this town. And um, more recently, we've been um, occasionally the object of the Spokane Street Preachers and stuff like that. And it's a form of bullying. And you can't let it go. You, it's domestic terrorism. And you can't stand um, and hope that it'll go away. You have to stand against it. You have to stand in <laughs> peace and you have to know what you're standing for. But you have to stand, and it's our time as allies and as the people of Spokane to stand together. Thank you. Um, I have two sort of plugs. Uh, one is one that I forgot to say at the beginning during my big long list of things to remember. Uh, I think Kate Bits is in the audience. And yay! Um, I want to thank Kate for helping to organize uh, the letter, but also you have a um, petition, right? That I think you'll, that's uh, for this event and for the library that will be available for folks to sign. Do you mind kind of making yourself seen? There it is, right back there. Okay, thank you. And then I also wanna thank Peace and Justice Action League of Spokane uh, for providing peacekeepers at the, yeah, on Saturday.
And uh, if anyone in the room has previous peacekeeper training and is interested in being a part of that group, uh, I want to connect you with the person who's organizing them. So let me know. One of the things that I want to clear up uh, before we head into Saturday's uh, event, um, there has been some misinformation in the media. Um, number one, this, uh, this event, uh, Drag Queen Story Hour, is not funded by the National Drag Queen Story Hour Foundation. These are individuals that are volunteering their time. Taxpayers volunteering their time to read to children in our community. As taxpayers, we have the right to use the library just like anybody else. And because this, because this is the United States, if there's a book in the library you don't like, you don't have the right to burn it. Move past it. If you don't want to be here, don't come. You don't agree with same-sex marriage? Don't marry a gay man. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, uh, Ellen, how are we doing on time? We doing okay? I think we can take a couple questions from the audience. So the lights are kind of bright. Um, yes, please. Well, I just want to say, first of all, as far as talking about the gender and, and kids being confused, my granddaughter is seven years old. She's been around Nova her entire life, and she knows her as Auntie Nova and Uncle Jason. So she's not confused. She knows. But for those that don't know me, I'm Faye, and I organize the Peace Angels. And for those that don't know who the Peace Angels are, we are the ones that actually stand in front of the protesters every year at the Pride Parade. And the first year that we started was in 2014, and there was three of us versus about 20 of them. This year, it was really awesome to see on the news that they said that they didn't notice any protesters because this was our biggest year of angels where we had 20. So we've grown every year. So... I just want to let you guys know that we will be there on Saturday with you guys. Um, we won't have as big of a crowd of angels, but we will be there on Saturday. And what I'm kind of hoping for is that we will be able to be on the sidewalk at the walkway. So that way we can let the families come in because the angels, angel action started in 1999 when Matthew Shepard was killed. And the angels actually blocked out the Westboro Baptist Church. So that way his family was able to come into the courthouse when he, his murderers were on trial. So I want us to be able to block out as much as we can of the protesters so that way the children and the families don't have to see the hate when they're walking into the, the library on Saturday. So that's what our goal is. So I just wanted to let you guys know that the angels will be there on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, we've got a woman right here. Yeah. Oh, we've got a mic. We got a mic coming. Yeah. That way we can all hear you. First of all, I just want to applaud you all for being here. And I'm glad to be here in support of reading and literacy and all the stories that are included in this library and that we need to protect it <clears throat> and having access to that for every person. Growing up here in Spokane, when in the 80s and in the 70s, we didn't have clubs or galleries or music and the only place you could get that was at the library. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really glad that the library is expanding, you know, and that we can have access to that. Um, my question is, is what story are you going to read on Thursday? I'm really excited. I'm just dying to know. I'm really excited. It's a great question. Yeah. So I actually have a list on my phone, which I don't have with me because I'm not good at being prepared. <laughs> for things that I don't know what I'm doing at. Um, but I know the stories that I will be reading personally um, at both events. Uh, I will be reading a story called The Princess and the Pony, uh, which is a lot of fun, uh, a lot of farting in that book. So <laughs> I think that one's going to go over pretty well. Uh, <laughs> we will also be reading um, a book. I will be reading a book called um, uh, Not All Princesses Wear Pink. Um, 
And then I believe we are going to be reading Teddy's Favorite Toy, something, I think it's called that. And then uh, Love is Love is Love is going to be the, uh, the books that we are going to be reading. So none of these books have a secret agenda. None of these books are going to make your kids gay. Um, <laughs> these books... <laughs> yeah, you know, hey, I don't think there's anything more, uh, more straight than farting. <laughs> but yeah, um, the books that we've chosen, uh, we chose very uh, deliberately. We wanted to tell stories that show kids that um, they aren't restricted by society to be what they, you know, what society thinks they should be. Um, we also chose stories that are just going to be fun and uh, stories that kids are going to like. So we're very, very excited about the uh, about the the titles we've chosen. <laughs> Sounds fun. That's great. Um, I saw a hand. Well, some one right here, and then uh, we'll get to you in just a second. Okay, we've got one back here. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, I'm looking for a site for my kids that uh, I was lucky to come across this event because I've met Nova, I've met Jason, Nico, I've, you know, I try to stay active because my son is curious about the drag um, world. Long story short is I'm going to be there Sunday or Saturday. 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 Show up whenever you want. <laughs> I got three kids. I ended up with two twin daughters. I don't know who I pissed off for that one. Um, but we're going to be there. But I'm looking for a f like Facebook site that has all the information. But I need one that's well moderated so I don't have to dig through all the trash talk and everything else. I mean, I, I respect those angels like there's no tomorrow because I couldn't do it. I... I, I would say your, your best bet for, you know, a place to, to get all the information without there being rhetoric would be the Spokane li uh, Public Libraries, either their, uh, their page, their website, or their Facebook page. Um, all of the events, including this one, are listed on their, um, on their Facebook page. And uh, you can also call and ask questions. I, I know that they are very well trained in answering the phones uh, after the last couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I would say go directly to the source. That would be my, my personal suggestion. And then where do I find information for the drag community uh, events and things of that nature? <laughs> I, do, I do follow Miss Kane, I just... I, my Facebook, I try to do um, a complete list of not only everything that's going on within the bar scene as far as the drag shows in the bars, but I also try to make a complete list and calendar of everything that's going on in the community. The entire LGBTQ, LMNOP, the whole gamut. And that's everything from Sandpoint to Moscow, uh, from Coeur d'Alene to Yakima. I try to put as, ex as extensive a calendar as I possibly can. So if you want to go to Novocaine um, on Facebook, K-A-I-N-E, or if you even just want to check out the Imperial Sovereign Court of Spokane, their Facebook, I try to do the community calendar twice a week, uh, usually at the beginning of the week as to what's going on, then on Thursday nights, which we're coming up on the witching hour, uh, Thursday night at 8 o'clock, for those of you who use Facebook, if you're going to advertise or promote, Thursday at 8, Everybody is done with dinner and they've pulled out their phone going, huh, wonder what's going on this weekend. <laughs> so that's, uh, tonight I'll be making a post of all of the things going on this weekend. This is Pride Month, so we have Pride events. Portland's Pride is this weekend. Um, uh, so is Snohomish County, no, Snohomish County was last week. Um, I don't remember all of them off the top of my head. I know that Seattle's Pride is, uh, is the 30th. That's, we're like one of the few prides in the nation that's actually on Saturday. Most of the prides across the country fall on Sunday. So, so if you want to hit my Facebook, also Out Spokane is a great resource for the calendar of what's going on in the community. I think we've got one right here. I think this might be the, uh, Ellen, where, where are you? She's my timer. Maybe one more? One more right here. Hello. Um, there's actually three parts to this. Number one, I want to know how I can look as good as you. <laughs> or you when it's time. 
Um, number two, and maybe this won't make sense, but I see these transgender people fighting to become what is inside, to be them, to be real. And, and their body's not doing it for them. My body is not doing it for me because I'm fat and I'm ill. So it's like the same thing. They're fighting with their body to get out and to be the better person. And I'm fighting to lose weight and be the healthy person I want. And then let's all remember what Rule Paul says at the end of his show. If you can't love anybody, you can't, what's he say? What? You if you love can't yourself. love yourself, oh, how in the hell are you going to love, love you? Love That's right. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> Anyhow, we're all people. We breathe the same. We put the pants on the same. Education, uh, that was the other thing. Ignorance plays huge in this. I used to work in an uh, AIDS clinic, and I told a gentleman that, and he, did, he stepped back from me. And I said, there's no danger of you ever getting AIDS from me, thank you. So it was a hard, a hard, ugly time when I did work there, but some of the most wonderful people in the world. Rule number one, cover girl does not cover boy. <laughs> well, I think um, we are at time. I Please join me in thanking our amazing, fabulous panel.